Enlightenment is known as the crux and the epitome of spiritual awakening. For some people, they have put it so high on a pedestal that they will never be able to reach it, let alone embody it. So today I'm going to be talking all about what enlightenment truly is. And at the end of this video, I will tell you the number one symptom of enlightenment that you probably may have never guessed. The reason why enlightenment has been portrayed as completely unattainable is because it's been translated through the perception of old spiritual paradigms. So we've been going off of what enlightenment is from a very one-dimensional depiction of a multi-dimensional state of mind. And what I mean by that specifically is the fact that we've pulled bits and pieces of what we feel enlightenment is based off of a depiction of only a one-dimensional portrayal of enlightened individuals or prophets or some sort of spiritual guru that we have placed in a figure that we cannot attain. So we've set ourselves up to not feel like we could ever be in an enlightened state, no matter how much we revere it or no matter how much we try to attain it along a spiritual path. So do you see the position we've put ourselves in? We've put us on this perpetual cycle of wanting something that we can never actually attain or embody. But the destiny of the spirit of this age is enlightenment. And not just for a select few, for the awakening masses, the state is enlightenment, meaning that we are all gonna eventually need to come to terms with our own divinity, whether we like it or not. How the state of enlightenment has been portrayed in the past as divinity at the expense of our humanity. So it's all divine, no human. All good, human bad. And those teachings served us because we're still getting more of the story we're still growing and we're still evolving and therefore we're able to access and align with more truth. So the old spiritual paradigm had truth within that story contained. However, now we're adding to it. And so since we're adding to it, enlightenment is going to shift in what we regard as that state. So if we viewed enlightenment in the past as being a discombobulated state, meaning spirit at the expense of body, spirit or mind at the expense of the emotional body and our humanity and our other dimensions that we contain within our being, then what that's going to look like for the new spiritual age is a coming into equilibrium. Once this equilibrium is attained within the being, what you have is the birthing in the frontal lobe and in the neocortex. What this births is conscious. Conscious is spiritual sovereignty. So enlightenment, and equilibrium and spiritual sovereignty can all be viewed from different perceptions as the same thing. The reason why conscious is so important within an individual is because that's when there's no external force that needs to guide or rule it because they are so in alignment with universal consciousness. They are completely operating from the state of consciousness known as Dharma. If you'd like to know more about Dharma, let me know in the comments and I'll make a video explaining everything about Dharma in depth. The number one prerequisite for enlightenment is embodying and operating from the state of oneness. In fact, enlightenment can also be known as oneness. And this isn't just a fleeting type of oneness that you experience in one of those peak experiences that are so available to us in the spirit of this age. This is the walking, breathing, living reality of oneness. It doesn't go away. It's not something that strikes you and then leaves you. If it strikes you, if it penetrates you to the core, it stays with you and you now operate from this level of being. Even if it's from a very discombobulated state at first, even if it takes time to fully integrate that state, you are now within that new realm, operating from oneness. This is also called samadhi, but I would actually define the difference between samadhi and oneness as being this. Samadhi is a peak experience that is always attained, whereas oneness is not a peak experience that's always attained. Oneness is more of just an everyday walking, breathing reality where you understand that you are the avatar and you understand that you have an ego and you're not at all at odds with it, but yet at the same time, you understand all of this coming from the sense of you are an aperture of the heart of the universal one. So you understand there's more than one aperture and that you are connected to it all and you are operating as an avatar, as an ambassador of the all in your avatar 
And so there is a defining difference between those states. But like I said, oneness isn't something that is fleeting. It's not something that goes away. If you experience it to the point where it's penetrated you, then you're actually operating now within that realm. And what's gonna actually happen is you just have layer after layer or awakening after awakening revealed to you deeper. So it acts more as an unfoldment. Now, oneness is kind of hard to explain, even though it sounds simple, because what oneness means to a person who is not operating from that state of enlightenment yet is gonna be different from somebody who begins to enter and operate from that state of oneness. Oneness before enlightenment is kind of like a strong empathy. It's, there's nothing wrong with it, but there's just this really like, Strong empathy is the best word I could use for it because what we're doing is essentially going like, yeah, we are all one. Yeah, we like we understand we're all one, but we only understand it from a very human concept and breadth and width. Whereas in oneness, you understand the utter reality of it from all of the lengths and the depths of what that even entails. It's the difference between understanding a concept and being the living reality of that concept. And because of that, enlightenment takes some time to get used to operating from this state of being because it can even be experienced as traumatizing. And it is traumatizing to the ego when we first step into this state. Because if you think about it, if there were ever an ego death, enlightenment is the ultimate ego death. The funniest part about this is you have a lot of really just high consciousness individuals right now going through spiritual awakenings, not having a great context for it, freaking out because they're like, uh, I don't feel reality as the same. And really they're starting to experience the beginning symptoms and stages of enlightenment. And yet they're interpreting it through the aperture of depression, of being blocked, of stuckness. And all of those are very valid and real things, but they're a part of a larger process. And so the most beautiful thing about enlightenment that many people are going through right now is, is that they can't even see their own beauty and they don't even have a proper mirror for just how conscious of an individual they are and how responsible of a being they are to even be able to start attaining and embodying these states of consciousness. The process of enlightenment is known as alchemy, which is why in alchemy, the final stage is gold, from lead to gold. And that gold, what it really means is enlightenment. The light from enlightenment is the light of gold, golden light. And how we are transmuted into gold is through a refinement process, a cyclical process of division and unity that eventually purifies us into the distilled state of enlightenment. But really, as I said, what enlightenment is, is the unification and the integration of the mind-body-spirit complex. So if the old spiritual paradigm was only holding space for one dimensional depiction of what enlightenment was, and if that depiction was one where it was at the expense of humanity, only to favor divinity, then what enlightenment truly would look like now in this spirit of the age would be the reclaiming of all the different multidimensional aspects within us, the integration of those aspects, the harmony within them, and then the equilibrium between the hemispheres. And what that's gonna look like is the opposite of repression. And so we had a very repressed version of what enlightenment was. And so because of that, we ourselves are trying to repress ourselves in order to get into some sort of image or depiction of what enlightenment would look like, when in actuality, the unraveling and the unwinding of that self-image is what enlightenment truly is gonna start taking on as our new reference point. And this new reference point is gonna allow into our being more of our true higher self. I mean, people have such a repressed version of enlightenment right now that they think you're not even allowed to experience human emotions within that state. And that's just not true. Enlightenment is kind of like the next launching point off from once you've accepted and embodied and started operating from that. So it's a big deal until it's not a big deal anymore. In fact, once you fully integrated enlightenment, it's not like you go around talking about it to people or that you go, I'm enlightened, because that once again, that's like the ego. It's just one of those things where you've developed so much harmony within your total mind, body, spirit complex that that isn't such a big deal. You can even accept the reality 
of a living, breathing oneness rather than mocking it or feeling like this is something that is unattainable and that you are on some constant treadmill with a carrot in front of you trying to reach enlightenment and yet rejecting it at the same time. And so if you're off of the treadmill and if you've settled into your being, what that really means is you have presence. And lo and behold, guess what's a part of presence? Enlightenment. An enlightened being doesn't judge negative emotional states or the fact that they experience them. They don't freak out if they get angry or if they have to cry. And because they are gentle and honor their emotional body, they allow it to move through whatever it needs to move through. And that ends up taking on an accelerated rate to not only their own awakening, but to their own integration. And because they're able to integrate and move through their emotional body with such ease and navigation, enlightenment and spiritual bypassing oftentimes get confused for one another. However, they only get confused for one another when somebody doesn't have a strong level of discernment. Here is how you know if you're dealing with spiritual bypassing or if you're actually dealing with enlightenment. With spiritual bypassing, there is always an expense. Whereas with enlightenment, there is no expense. And what I mean by that is a being who is in spiritual bypassing is going to have something favored at the cost of something else, meaning that they are in a sort of rejection of the ego, meaning that they're in some sort of denial of an aspect within their being. So with spiritual bypassing, there's always this subtly venomous tone that has something at the expense of something else. And with enlightenment, there is no expense. So there is no ego versus divinity, humanity versus spirit. There's simply no aversion. And so because there's no aversion, you can still honor the fact that the ego has a detrimental aspect and side to it and not be repulsed by it. So even if we're talking about negative emotions, there's no repulsion to them. We're just being able to honor and discern the fact that there are higher or lower. There's less dense and there's lighter levels of being within us. And that, that doesn't mean that this is something that we're talking about from a state of rejection. If anything, enlightenment just comes from an ability to reclaim and to integrate and to be at peace with our humanity. You're gonna see this time and time again. You're gonna go through a maze of spiritual bypassing or enlightenment, because I promise you, this is such a strong theme during spiritual awakening, where you're going to be questioning, wait, am I in a state of spiritual bypassing or am I in a state of spiritual awakening deeper and deeper into enlightenment? And so your number one guide, your number one marker through this is gonna be, do I have a version? Am I coming from a place of denial? Do I have subtle venom regarding this emotional state, regarding my own being, regarding whatever it is that we are in judgment or repression of? That's gonna be your best marker for whether you or a being is spiritual bypassing. Whereas with enlightenment, your knowing just doesn't all of a sudden disappear. What happens is it thoroughly integrates. So one is a dismembered, discombobulated state, and the other is a remembered and united state. The number one sign of enlightenment, once you have integrated this state of oneness, is that you can't really remember that much anymore. It's a good type of not remembering though. It's not one of those disease states that are very severe and very real. It's a state of being so present that you're not really able to remember that much of the past or it becomes a little fuzzy. You're not able to retrieve things like, no, you did that, I did that, and that was exact. And so it's the state of being where you retrieve information as you need it, but you don't necessarily carry it with you the whole time. Things come in when needed. Revelations come in when they're needed. But we're not able to have like a lot of exact details and information and data about the past. And that truthfully just comes with the territory. It's something that we get used to to along the journey of being able to retrieve things when they're absolutely necessary, but most of the time not having that knowing until it's absolutely needed. And then also just not really remembering a lot about the past, which once again, looks an awful lot like spiritual bypassing because what's one of the things that comes with a lot of spiritual bypassing? We're holding on to a lot of trauma when we're in the state of spiritual bypassing. And yet trauma has so much lack of memory and not ability to retrieve information within that. And yet on the polar end of the spectrum, we have enlightenment, which also is able to not retrieve or remember that much. However, it's come from deep, deep healing and enormous amount of inner work. So one of these states comes from extreme pain and denial, and the other state comes from extreme acceptance. And yet sometimes 
the features of these two can to the untrained eye only mirror or resemble one another. The reason why we lose our memory in enlightenment is because we're in the constant and eternal now moment. And when we're in the eternal now moment, that's guided by synchronicity. And that plane of existence doesn't always have the same access to memory that's available when we're in the third dimensional concept of memory. So it's not that we don't have memory anymore, it just functions completely different. I hope this has helped you own both your humanity and your divinity. Make sure to subscribe to my channel for higher dimensional guidance through spiritual awakenings. See you next time.